Um, so just to switch gears now, we're going to have Scarlett McNally from the Trinity Medics Association um, presenting about surgery and surgical thinking. It's lovely to come and talk to you about surgery. Um, most of you won't remember me from Trinity because I spent most of my time doing karate um, when I was here. So um, anyway, um, this is what I do for my day job. A broken hip on the x-ray, fixed hip down there. Very, very common. One in four people that reach the age of 65 is going to go on and have a hip fracture. So that's what you do. You need surgeons. And it's great. And what most people want me to talk about is there are not that many women consultants in surgery, are there? And actually it drops at 50% roughly at each of the um, steps, the hurdles you have to take in medicine. It drops from about 55% women at medical school down to about 9% at consultant level. I'm going to talk to you about that briefly, but actually surgery is great fun. We're very simple. It's a simple idea. Something's broke you fix it, you know? You just need to know where the anatomy is so you don't get something wrong. And there's a bit about talking to the person before, talking to the person after, and building up the teamwork as well. But actually doing it, I could be a plumber or a carpenter, <laughs> and maybe you wouldn't have invited me here to talk, so I'm very pleased you have. Um, but it's actually not difficult once you can do it. What we do is we cut things out, principally cancers or things that are in the wrong, wrong place. We fix things. We unblock blockages, tubes that have got too narrow or something like that. Uh, we rearrange a bit of anatomy and we biopsy things, mostly to see if it's cancer or something like that. So that's what we do. Um, we drain things as well. I should have put that there. We drain things. So that's what we do. Okay, um, so that's the first 15 seconds. Now, this is heresy, okay? Because surgeons are incredibly important, okay? Incredibly important. Um, it is, I think, the hallmark of a civilized society. You want to know that if you get some rare cancer, someone somewhere can chop it out and fix it. You want to know if you get hit by a bus, somewhere, someone somewhere can put you back together again, and that's what you need. You need to hold that to rely on. <laughs> um, but actually, it's pretty easy. It's about set pieces. You start at the beginning, you go on to the end. It's like, you know, dressmaking or something. You know what you have to do, and you get on, and you do it, and it takes a while, and you just do it. Um, teamwork is key. You rely on your team. And actually, a bit of the heresy is it's not about the 24-7 provision of care. It's about trying to get as much of the care done by teamwork, which you can only run a good team during the day, Monday to Friday, maybe Saturday mornings, with a team you know, where someone will help you put the patient in the right position, the right way you want it, so you can work. You know? So daytime work is key. Don't listen to what they say about 24-7. We want the seven-day working, but not the nighttime working, nighttime life or limb threatening. And then you don't have to be heroic up all night, saving lives, being heroic, not being there to put your kids to bed or whatever. You can, you can do it. We're all on a 48 hour week contract at the moment, plus the extra bits that you do for free because it's fun. Um, <laughs> a bit about don't screen unless you've got a treatment to offer. People going for screening tests then might cause a problem that they didn't know they had, then they've got to have treatment for. So just be cautious of that. And a bit, actually, there's quite a few complications. I heard somewhere 10% of operations will have a complication or a thing going wrong that the person didn't expect. So a bit of it about communication, which is actually what quite a lot of people are quite good at and what we completely fail to select our surgeons in how to do. <laughs> now, surgery is incredibly competitive. I did an article that got published, and surgery, all the surgical specialties are down here. Okay, so you've got about a 10% chance of being appointed. That's even once you've reached the age of 29, which is when the, the principal selection time occurs into specialist training. This here is the percentage of female applicants. Um, and it, it, at that time, that's 20, 2005 days, we're nearly 10 years out of date, but that's what's putting, that was at that time putting the women off because you've got to have a plan B that's working. And if at that time you've got something else on your mind, that's much more difficult. We can talk about that later at great length. Um, but um, those are the hurdles. And the critical hurdle, you've got selection and exam at various points. But it's great for me. I can turn up to work wearing what I like because people know I've got there. I don't have to prove myself or win a contract or whatever on a daily basis. I just turn up, do my work. People, you know, it's not, it's not difficult. I've got an NHS salary and hopefully an NHS pension in another 12 and a half years. Um, but the critical step is this one, getting onto the registrar training for your specialty. And that's critical. I just want to draw your attention to that. Because that's when a lot of women have other things on their mind. It's the, <laughs> it is, or, or other people on their mind. Um, it is the average age to have, to get pregnant for the first time if you've gone, finished school and gone on to higher education. It's also the median age for getting married in the UK, which is a slightly different thing, but I just thought I'd draw that to your attention. So you've got to think about what your person who's making that career critical decision and the selection 
Um, that's why we haven't got enough women in surgery, quite frankly, in my opinion. But, you know, that's quite an uh, opinion I've formed over a number of years. OK. Um, but we can do it. There's maternity leave like there is for anyone else. And there's the stuff about how to, we can work with x-rays. X-ray machines are now designed to work with radiographers that don't know they're pregnant. Um, so they're designed to be safe. Yeah. So um, you can work with them. And there's got, but the problem is if you're a doctor and you say, I need to work with x-rays because I'm a, trained to be an orthopedic surgeon, but I'm pregnant, you'll have a manager going, no, you can't do that. You can't go near an x-ray machine. And suddenly you're off the on-call. You're not building up your competencies to get to the next stage, the next exam, the next level, and you'll fall apart and not, not, uh, not continue in surgery. So we do need to do something about getting women back into work after they've had a baby, because that's quite hard. And it's made more difficult because of money. The funding has been re reduced for less than full-time training. So people that are still in training, which they mostly are, because the training is so long, um, we need to get them back in. We need to have extra, I believe, supernumerary funding for less than full-time trainees in surgical specialties or in craft specialties. Because you do go a bit wobbly when you've got a small baby and you've, you know, you've, you've gone back to work and you've got to relearn. So that's what we need. It comes down to money. It's only about 10 grand you need to, to pay for someone to backfill. So you just go there and do this, the bits you need to do. Um, I know that's slightly off-piste, but um, moving on. So. <clears throat> In there is Dottie. She's just finished primary school in July, um, which is lovely. And underneath all that is um, there's a patient there who's got a hip fracture, which um, she's having a replacement rather than a fixation, but it's all the same kind of thing. Um, so that was me, um, obviously. Um, breastfeeding, no one talks about breastfeeding because it's all a bit rude. Um, but you kind of want to do it for the first year because it's good for the baby, it's good for the mother. Um, but no one tells you how to do it. so. Um, uh, you, you have to have a breast pump if you're working long hours and save the milk, put it in the freezer, daddy or the manny or, or child mind or whatever can give it to the baby later. And most babies can mix and match a little bit of formula and a little bit of breast milk. But you need to talk about it because otherwise your daughters won't go and be surgeons. Um, so, and that would be uh, a great shame. Um, so, um, it's still competitive. I read another article. Uh, this isn't just about me writing articles, but um, I just thought I'd show I'm not just being simple. Um, about it is very, very competitive, but it is still very male. And I put the two things together. Um, and what we do need to realise is there's 25 more years when they're going to be providing good, solid work for the NHS for the next 25 years and teaching and training and examining and all that stuff. And as soon as mine are all off at, you know, whatever they want to do, I have a bit more time to do other stuff. There is not discrimination against women at selection. In fact, the women who do apply are statistically significantly more likely to be appointed because so few actually apply. And that's useful. That's the reference on the previous one, which will be live streamed. Um, OK, so in my spare time, I'm full-time NHS, by the way, um, I'm, I got uh, elected to the Council of the College of Surgeons, Royal College of Surgeons, which is a very august institution in Lincoln's Infield. I'm the one with a tree growing out of my head there. <laughs> um, and, um, but it's fun. And you do change the way things are done a little bit, uh, which is fun too. I like that. And we do lots of very important stuff, like write important reports and uh, do examining and teaching and, and, and stuff. Um, other stuff. We've got a good careers uh, wing, so if any of you know medical students, junior doctors who want to do surgery, it's great. It's open to everyone, fantastic career. Um, and we've got a website and um, look, booklets and stuff like that. But don't be put off because of being a woman or being different or being short or not being strong or whatever. It's, it's, it's cool, um, but it is very competitive. Yeah? So they need to be the best. Um, so, I've got another uh, nearly five minutes to talk about everything else that's important. Um, uh, time, money, social class, education, cycling, and stuff like that. Um, <laughs> so, I think in the NHS, because now what's quite nice, it's nice being important, being on the college, uh, council of the College of Surgeons, um, is that I'm now going to other things like... Um, uh, which is a bit more about how the, how the NHS develops. So I think we need to change. The problem with doctors, particularly surgeons, we're treating one person, we're treating that individual. We're not blaming them for what they've done in the past. We're being really um, supportive of their future. We're not, you know, it's not about the fact you smoke too many cigarettes and you've got a lung cancer we have to cut out, for example. It's about, we, you know, no blame. And it's all about the individual. And money, no object. You could have her set in for the breast cancer. You would just get on them. You know, it's individual. Fantastic. I think we need to change to... Treating all society, where you do make assumptions, and we change in fact. In fact, most disease is preventable. Yeah? We just don't get on and do it. So, ooh, four minutes left. Okay. Um, 
these are the emergency admissions to NHS hospitals. It's a stupid graph. I apologise to the real scientists here because it starts at number four. But it's going up lots. Yeah? The number of millions of admissions to NHS hospitals every year in England. Um, there's also a huge gradient in who gets ill. Yeah? This is the Marmot report, um, Fair Society, Healthy Lives. And there's been another report from the BMA about what, what doctors can do about the fact that some people get much iller than others yeah, in different sections of society. And to be honest, what the BMA report, which I've read hundreds of times, um, says is we've just got to measure it. We've got to notice it. We've got to be aware of it. We've got to measure it. And you've got to be sympathetic. You've got to be aware. You've got to try and be a patient's advocate. Yeah? Um, and this is some of, the, some of the stuff. But it doesn't talk about what to do, what to do to change it. So I'm going to tell you in the last three minutes what to do to change it. This is your chance. I can't read the green bit. Um, this is your, your number of years lived with dis increased number of years lived with disability, for example. I can't remember what it is. According to social, how many qualifications you've got, yeah, no qualifications, you're twice as likely to die early and have twice as many years of ill health, um, and twice as likely to get certain diseases. This is another one about the risk of children dying according to socioeconomic class. You know, that's about ten times your chance of your kid dying if you're in social class eight which is how they de you know, defined it in that particular paper as compared to social class one, but it goes up. Um, that's your risk of heart disease according to the depri how deprived your ward is. And that's huge and that's shocking. You know, it is huge and it's shocking. Um, and um, the other point is how many people are getting old but getting ill old. Yeah? Years and years of taking multiple tablets and being ill for a number of years, not being healthy and robust and going about and, and being active and then suddenly you know, reaching the end of your lifespan, but being ill for a number of years. Now that's rocketing with people with multiple conditions. And yet, services are designed by predominantly people that think of only one condition. I apologise to people in the audience that might feel they could fit into this category. Fit, healthy, male, ambulant, affluent, socially supported, social class one or two 60-year-olds who never go on buses. <laughs> um, Services are not designed for people with multiple problems. Yeah? Dementia is rocketing, absolutely rocketing. Um, and we've got to think about that, not just for our own parents, yeah? but the carers, the people that would be working harder and paying more, more um, into society with taxes or whatever. But people, you know, it's huge, it's huge. It's going to be a million of us with dementia by 2021. And that's a huge amount of money. There's various things, as I said, trying to get people more active. I'd like to just draw your attention to the Academy of Medical Royal Colleges. There's, there's got lots of committees. I'm on the Health Inequalities Forum. I'm a surgeon. I volunteered because it's great. No one else um, seemed to want to do it. So we want a surgical approach to health inequalities. Now, what's the most dangerous activity you can do? Anybody? Sitting. Yes, you're all doing it. <laughs> Um, it's a dangerous activity and loads of people don't do enough because what links that we're all the same species what links people in social class 8 or 5 or however it's counted being so much iller for so much longer of their lives than in people social class 1 uh, you can you know you look at the social causes social class parenting pollution accidents that might have been preventable if you thought about it in a different way but actually if you think about the physical causes it's nutrition smoking physical activity and alcohol in ex excess are the huge huge causes of most preventable illness oh. um, Physical inactivity is number th three or four, depending on how you count it, in the per percentage that is um, a, a contribution to disease. What we want is people to get up and do 30 minutes, five times a week of physical activity. We want the whole population to do that, um, and it reduces your risk by 30 to 80% of all these things. Dementia, 30%. Yeah? Some cancers, 33%. Breast cancer. Um, the column on the left is your lifetime risk, the column on the right is how much it reduces by. It's huge, it's huge and most people don't do that and we don't think about that because the people we see are the fit, healthy people like ourselves. Um, I'm sorry I've gone over time but I'm going to keep talking very, very fast. Um, <laughs> cycling is fantastic, it's lovely to be back in, in Cambridge. Now this is a percentage, but everyone should be up on that 100% line, this is by age group. Lots of people just don't get enough exercise, it's only about half the pop less than half the population reach enough exercise at any one time. And I'm trying to get cycle lanes in Eastbourne. People don't cycle because they're scared. They're scared of the traffic. And yet the best form of exercise, best form of that, five times a week for 30 minutes a time is cycling somewhere and cycling home or walking briskly. You've got to get out of breath. Yeah? Um, women at each age group cycle half the amount that men cycle because the cycle lanes are designed for the middle-aged men in, in Lycra, mammals. Uh, they're not designed for the women with a kid. Yeah? Now, you can achieve change. I was talking to someone over lunch about plastic bags. 
dog poo. You don't step on dog poo anymore because it's a change of culture. Yeah, we can change it by everyone doing a bit to get more active. But particularly, we need to do the, the um, infrastructure so people can do it. This is the cyclists injured. The blue dots are injured. The red triangles are fatalities of people on their bikes. That's why people don't cycle. They tell me, oh, no, Mrs. McNally, I'm not going to cycle. It's far too dangerous. I'd much rather sit in my car and get dementia. Um, <laughs> this is the cycle routes around Eastbourne. Note the word I say, around. It's not where people want to go. They go out on a Sunday afternoon. It's not raining with the kids but having put the bikes on the car and driven. Um, what we want is this network um, of cycle lanes that people can just do stuff. And it doesn't cost much. It'll cost £100,000 to put a cycle lane on the seafront, a proper one, um, but they won't pay it because it's too expensive. This is lovely. I come up to the cottage once a week. That's the Mal. You feel you belong. You're allowed to be there because there's a cycle lane. It didn't cost much to put that in. Um, the money, they say there isn't the money there. It actually costs £50,000 for someone to stay in a nursing home for a year. And yet that person might not have needed to have been there if they had actually done some exercise when they were 60 or 70. Work prevents ill health. £120 billion NHS budget, 70, 70% is spent on long-term conditions, most of which could have been preventable a bit. Not entirely preventable, but maybe 30%. That's good enough. Nearly half my local council budget goes in um, adult social care, paying for people. Um, and, and you can get cycle lanes put in. They've done it in Bexhill. And um, we need to do lots more activity, bringing out Academy of Medical Royal Colleges five a week. Just do it. Watch it. When it comes in, out in November, retweet it for me. Um, we're also doing another project on teenage pregnancy because it's to do with the... the re if you have very short generation time, at the end of 100 years, you've got 1,000 people rather than 27 people, roughly. And also, you've got lots of teenage boys that don't respect their mothers, that learn more from their, their friends and their brothers than they do from their, their mothers, and that could contribute to wars, potentially, or uh, society not being quite as respectful of women as it ought to be. Um, so we're bringing out something else, not called to when. Um, and it's to do with, you know, 45% pregnancies are unintended. If you don't know you're pregnant, you've been binge drinking, you carry on drinking, alcohol crosses the placenta, it, it crosses the blood-brain barrier, that kid is going to have a difficult life because it affects their brain development, and that's, that causes health inequalities in children, which is 25% of the population um, are children, and we need to think about them in terms of health inequalities, better education, better job opportunities. And um, so it's a surgical approach to all of healthcare and to how we design cycle lanes. Thank you very much. <laughs>